should we should we get rid of should we do it all all the dick jokes at first or should we save those to kind of uh, now we're gonna throw those dick jokes in as we go man all right we save them for the better times for the better times what's up everybody we appreciate you guys joining us there we go populate we're pumped we're getting ready to talk some dick all right I think we should get all the jokes <laughs> jokes out of the way at first. No, we I can't changed my mind. <laughs> we have to wait. <laughs> all right, so we want to talk Grady Dick, the um, outstanding shooter from Kansas. He's got some hops too, um, bro. What do you think about overall, like his fit with the Thunder? Because he's been talked about quite a bit. You know, linked up with the Thunder recently. Well, anytime that you see a shooter with. Uh, Grady's ability is truly spectacular. Um, one thing uh, when I was going through his film and obviously I, I like Kansas basketball and I like Bill Self. Um, so I like to watch uh, Kansas hoops. One of the things I love about Bill Self is that he is really what I would consider an expert at developing role players. And I look at um, Grady Dick and I say, you know, Nick Collison, you know, that type of player that, you know, yeah, you Nick see... Collison was Roy Williams. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, but the same system. Darren Carlson, I think maybe it was, I don't know. Um, same system, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, anyways, so I, I look at it and I say, I look at Grady Dick and I say, Bill Self, and I say, you know, what 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 could be the possibility that Grady fits on this team and and, and, and does the, what, what I would consider um, a role player to be on this team? Because we're not looking for a star. We're not looking for a superstar. But right now we're looking for players that will be able to come into the team right away and fit. And I look at Grady Dick at, at 19 years old and I say, this young man's ready to come in because his his spot up shot. Um, let me go ahead and pull the, the stats out for his spot up shot. Um, his pull up shot, I'm sorry. Uh, he shoots 46% from his pull up. I mean, I think that's really crucial because uh, in the NBA, you have to have that pull up. You have to have a step back. You have to have all these other tools. You can't just be a spot up shooter. Um, but when he's um, spot up shooting, which is, again, it's all about the footwork. It's all about getting him open. Uh, he's shooting 36, 38 percent um, across the whole um, across the board. So that's um, inside the three point line and outside the three point line. So you know that right there is something I like to circle because you know that he can shoot if he's left open, and that's something that's you know Josh Giddy finds a lot of you know. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, what's better than Giddy Dick? You know, like I mean, the announcers would be going crazy with that. Like Josh Giddy, Giddy passes to Dick, wide open, baby. You know they'd have fun with it. Almost as much fun as we'd have with it. But overall, though, while it's fun to make a lot of puns, and we will, um, no doubt about that, but, like, his game is really good. Like, every year it seems like there's a guy, a white guy that can really ball, that gets looked at as, like, well, is he, can he really ball? Um, I think of, like, a player like Kevin Herter. Mm -hmm. um, I think of... Um, who was the guy last year? Um, well, two years ago it was Franz Wagner. Um, he just really showed out. Um, there's constantly somebody who who you think like, well, okay, for some reason maybe um, we're kind of being prejudiced against him and holding back like his overall projection because he doesn't look like what we consider to be a future star or an elite player. I wonder if maybe Tyler Hero suffered from a little bit of that. Uh, maybe that was more because his short arms or whatever it was, you know, there's always like a reason that there's like to be a little bit prejudiced against the player and say like his um, build or his style, his whatever it, it's may, maybe it won't translate and it's hard to tell how it will go. I have a lot of confidence that his game is going to translate. Um, I think he's built for the modern league. Hmm. He, he can shoot over top because of the smoothness of his shot. Um, so that's not really, like nobody's qu going to question that. And when you hear people talk about Grady Dick, they're always going to say he's got the shot. He's got the shot. So then, you know, you mentioned his pull up. So, um, you know, shoot the three, put it on the floor and pull it up. So that's two levels. And then can he finish at the basket? And I noticed that he really does have the ability to get to the basket and finish um, his height, his athleticism. If he had gone to like, I don't know, a, a school like Duke, now, I know mm -hmm. Kansas isn't like a small school. I get that. But a school like Duke, I mean, this guy would probably be, you know, considered a top seven pick, you know. And if he had What's gone up, to uh, a different school, maybe like, 
I don't know, like what Kevin Herter went to, like Maryland, um, he might have been taken on a bigger offensive load also. And in that situation, might have been a higher pick too. It seems like mm-hmm. Kansas is a good school for him, but it kind of left him in a spot where he was surrounded by other talented players. So it wasn't just like, okay, he's going to go out and get 40. Like That mm-hmm. just wasn't his game. I didn't watch him play that much, but I watched enough highlights to see like he really played within the, like, the offensive system, and then he would um, know how to score within it, which is good. That's what you want in the modern league. Um, but this guy can ball. Like, yeah. He's he's already been able to show that. So the question is, I think deep down is what type of competitors is he? Because defensively, he's gonna have to figure that out. But like the level of competitor you are will take you a lot further than just I don't know the um, natural like level of talent and skill that you enter the NBA with. If he sure. takes pride on the defensive end. Then he really could, you know, be somebody that could be a two-way player, a three-level scorer, and be a really good fit um, for a wide range of teams. Like I think last year, the Grizzlies took a player like Jake Laravia, who I really liked, and I felt like could be a good player. Um, he could fall a little bit like that, but I really think Grady Dick is going to be a top. He's going to be a lottery pick. I mean, you can agree on that, right, Dave? Oh, no doubt. I mean. I, I see how he moves without the ball. I see how he's you know fluent within the offense of the system in, in Kansas, and, I, and that translates very easily in the Oklahoma system. Um, one thing without um, the way he moves without the ball is is completely elite as far as a 19 year old um, causing issues on the defensive side for the other teams. And I think the thing that we have to look at is how big of an offensive threat he is all around. Um, I, I like the way his hands are quick as well. Um, the fact is, is that he has such quick hands, and um, typically that's something you see on defense. That, that's a big thing on defense. But on offense, when you have quick hands, he's able to release the ball really quickly. He he jumps. He has a high release point at six foot eight, makes it really hard to block. Um, and he has this high release point with quick hands. Um, it's it's fast. So he catches the ball. He never brings the ball down. There's a lot of players that their first reaction is to bring the ball down, right? So he gets the ball and he gets it right here and he releases. There's, I mean, there's barely any movement to his shot at all. And I think that's key when you have a a six foot eight guy releasing. And again, when Josh Giddy gets to the hole and passes to him, he needs to be able to get that shot off quickly. And if you look at the way that he releases the ball, um, I, I, I like it. He reminds me a lot of, not just because he's white, but a lot of Gordon Haywood. Um, the way that he um, releases the ball, the way he gets downhill, his size, um, his knowledge of the game. Um, he's very, very knowledgeable. So, you know, if you're comparing him to a player, I would say um, Gordon Haywood. And, and Gordon Haywood was an all-star player for, what, uh, nine seasons, eight eight seasons in the NBA? So that's, you know, a good comp right there. I'm not saying he's going to get to that level, but if he's a good shooter and he learns how to play defense, then I, I feel like that puts you in a really good spot. Um, one of the things that... Kansas was really good at was passing the ball to the open space to where Grady was going to be at. And he would just stand there once he got there. Okay. So he would be running into a spot, then he would stand there and the ball would get there about half a second later. But the whole point is, is that I have yet to see a player at six foot eight, get his feet. So I'm um, set so quickly. It was like half a second on most of the shots that he got off. His feet were set before he got the ball. So he could release the ball within half a second of catching it. It's it's elite, man. I to me, I I see a young man that that understands how to shoot the ball, how to release the ball. His shot is beautiful, and I, I keep going back to the fact of what he could be for this Oklahoma City Thunder if he's still available. Because again, I'm looking at him and I'm saying if he's still at 12, that means that something else happened. Other players um, impressed in the NBA and stepped up, and if that's the case, then we have to take a Grady Dick. Um, I think the thing about is. Um, when you're looking at it, Mark, you talked about the three levels of scoring. You know, shooting the three pointer, he's got a pull up, he's got a great fadeaway, he's got a great turnaround jump shot, and he knows how to get to the hole when he needs to and using his size. He's not a small six eight. You don't look at him and say, Oh wow, he's a small six eight. No, he is a big, thick up, guy. Sammy? And he's just a big dude. His defensive um effort out there, again, I wasn't blown away by it. He's got a lot of work to do, but one point four steals is not a bad stat for college. Um, I think that that's something that um, 1.4 steals a game is is due to his um, hands um, hands quickness. And there's one play that I watched that he deflected the ball six times before he got the steal. Six times. So 
He understands what it takes to get there, and his hand speed's incredibly fast. We don't play a lot of man in ISO defense, and that's really what his weakness is on defense is that ISO, when he's designed to go one-on-one against somebody else. The ISO defense is something we want to cut out from him, but the thing about it is we play a zone defense most of the time out there. Even if it's a matchup man, we're still dropping back in a zone-type style. We would never um, have him play in that ISO defense. So, again, he would look more effective out there than most other teams that he'd be on being required to play ISO defense. We wouldn't require that from him when he was out there. Yeah, dude, we, um, we, we say this Sammy. recently quite a bit, but we really feel like whoever we pick will say a lot about the direction Sam, Sam Presley sees his team going in. So Grady Dick, to us, represents someone who can stretch the court and be an offensive threat. Absolutely. Um, it's not someone that we've really seen picked by Sam early, but we have seen and heard of a lot of interest um, when James Harden was up to be traded and they were trying to figure out what we were going to do with him. Um, we went after Clay Thompson. We went after Bradley Beal. And when I look at Grady Dick, I'm like, this guy has the ability to shoot the ball at the next level. And it's not going to be, it's not going to be one of those, those skills that people fail to recognize for very long within a few games he's going to make it to the scouting reports for teams and they're going to be like okay this guy's a problem and we had a guy like doug mcdermott which was like um Hmm. his thing was if you let him get going then he can become a problem but it was never like teams really gave a fuck about doug mcdermott but there's a place for players who can shoot the ball and he's young enough i feel like grady dick to me represents the next level of uh, you know, really elite players. He shoots the ball at like a deep range and a step back as fluidly as a lot of players shoot their regular three point shoot shot. And it, I just feel like because he's going to transition to the league and get plenty of shots, there's really a good chance that he plays for 12 to 15 years. Um, and while every time you draft a player, you're hoping that they are one of those players more often than not, even within the top 10 players don't make it to 15 years. So I just feel like this guy has got that level of game. Yeah. And the way that he plays, isn't going to be hard on his body. Um, a lot of the physical contact that he takes, he takes it, um, you know, and, and with stride because of his body size at six foot eight. I mean, the way he looks out there, he looks like he's a good two twenty five, two twenty, you know, at six, eight. And that's, I mean, that's a thick body at that age at 19. So, um that just is going to help him out you know you you look at these big guys that are like um j dub you know that have these really thick bodies in the nba and um lebron james like these guys they they find a way to to be able to use their body as an asset and if he ever figures out how to use his dick as a problem as a as a you know positive then it's over bro one all right um blake says austin reeves and I like that. Um, Boom Austin, sooner, baby. Austin has shown that a lot of teams made a mistake when they didn't get him. Um, it's it's interesting because players like Austin go out and show something, and then all of a sudden everybody's like trying to f- find the next Austin Reeves. Like we saw the same thing with Lou Dort. Well, go let's from just undrafted talk about it. To be like trendy. Austin Reeves. They just got swept. Our... Are we talking LeBron James is as years done with the uh, Los Angeles now? Are we talking it's 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 done for them? And then if so, what does that look like? Is he going to go try to play for a team that he can play with his son, or is he going to just go own a team for Las Vegas? I mean the, what he said last night kind of rocked me because I, I I haven't thought about an NBA without LeBron in twenty years. And all of a sudden he's just like, I need time to think about it. I don't know what I want to do now. Like, it's just like, what is, wait a second here. The like, nuggets, I thought we had two or three more years, you know? The Nuggets stomped on his heart. And, yo, that game, it was incredible what, what LeBron did in the first half. But it, it reminded me so much of when the Thunder beat them and he set the record. It was like he set a record and then he sat down. And then the team lost. It was like this game, bro, he, he kept playing in that third and fourth quarter. But I think he had like 33, 34 in the for in the first half and then he ended up on the game with 40 like and i don't even know that it was his fault like 
like other than not demanding the ball, but it was just Dude, like it kind of reminded me of that game Kobe just like wouldn't shoot. Anthony like, Davis is a is just a bitch, man. I hate saying it. Like I, with all due respect, like I mean, if there was a yes, Karen of the NBA, if there was a Karen of the NBA, AD would be it, man. Like I've never seen besides Luca cry and complain so much. Like listen, I played the game in such a way that every single game I had bruises, I had um, bloody. Uh, I, I was bloodied and bruised every single game and I watched AD out there, man. And he gets hit and all of a sudden he's like squinting his eyes and holding his head. And it was just like, bro, like acting like that is like, it just gets in your head and every little thing. And the problem is LeBron can't handle that. You know, no. he likes it when it was Dwayne Wade and, and, you know, Chris Bosch and they all did their own thing, you know? And AD, he's got to constantly be like, come on, AD, be a man. Be a man, AD, be a man. And I think he's just done with that. And then to me, like, I, I look at that, and if he says he's done, right, then where's he going to go? Like, where, where, like, the, what team is going to be like, yeah, we'll take LeBron? Because LeBron wants to play with his son, right? He's got one more year left on his contract. So, he's got whatever he wants to do. Man, could you see him go to Houston? Could you see him retiring without doing a re like a, a retirement tour? Like, no, he's too much into himself. And here's the thing about it: is I I look at it like I would see him have more success over the seven with the Seventy Sixers, with the Knicks. Um, yeah, I mean, we could go we could go on about the more success he would have with any of these other teams that are deeper and have better players than, and they have money. You know, like, and I think that's the thing about that. I'm, I'm sitting here looking at is like LeBron needs to be done in LA and he needs to go someplace else and he needs to try to bring his championship. I mean, fuck, go to the Suns, man. Yeah. Do something else. That's, a, I mean, that's do something else in the Lakers. Got to get it out of the Lakers. Dude, that's, I mean, it's interesting that you're bringing that up. Like, as in, like, he may not retire, but maybe he shouldn't be with the Lakers anymore. Like, the Lakers were a problem. Like halfway through the season, they had to readjust their lineup. They couldn't really get continuity. There was all sorts of trouble in the playoffs, and then get to sw to get swept like that. Yeah. Um, but like the Nuggets were really consistent and impressive all year. I told you it was gonna happen after game yeah. two, bro. I was like, they just don't have what it takes at all, you know. And it's just like something just like it was out. The light bulb went out there in in L.A. But. I mean, man, Sa Sammy, I, I want to throw this out here, Sammy. I appreciate you um, a lot of ways. And I, I'm definitely going to be opening that that box you just sent me online um, or on air so that you can see uh, that be opened. Um, but Perth Wildcats signed Alexander Saar, which is the brother of um, Olivia, Olivier, Olivier, whatever, however you say his name. But let me just tell you this right here. Mark and I have, I have looked at him. We've talked about him on the podcast before. We really, really like this young man. We think that he could be special. Um, and it's one of the reasons that I believe that the Oklahoma City Thunder continuously keeps Sar close to this whole situation. What's up, Corey? Absolutely, Dave. Um, so, you think it's a sweep tonight, too, with Miami? Yeah, bro. I think, dude, I, I went back and I was like, what is wrong with the Celtics? And I got a, an eyeful that I wasn't expecting. So, Masula, do you know what he does, bro? We've, we've been there before. We've had a coach like this. He goes out there and plays um, with the guys. He's playing pickup basketball with the guys during practice and stuff like that. He's constantly with them playing hoops, and it doesn't teach the guys respect. You know? There's no separation. He's just one of the dudes. So, when we say at the end of the game is what's happening, I mean, we know exactly what's happening. Nobody's listening to him. You know? And I'm watching it, and I, I just feel bad for Masula, man. Like, he has no idea at this point how to be a head coach. And it's interesting because we've seen it happen before with other um, teams that have, have picked um, coaches that haven't been um, head coaches in any stretch of the imagination. And they always have a rough couple of years. And usually the rough couple of years are okay because a team isn't ready to compete. But the Celtics, they want to win. They want to win now. And, you know, Spolsters is taking advantage of Masula. I mean, he's he's pushing all the buttons. He's doing all this other stuff. Like, I, I haven't seen a, a more masterful 
job of coaching against another um, team as Masulu is doing right now, or um, as um, um, Spolster is doing right now. Like he's just he's a masterclass, bro, and it's 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 beautiful. Did you see um, Jokic's brothers pick up Kevin Malone? <laughs> Matt Mike like, Malone. Put me down. Put me down. I know. He was not liking that, but it was hilarious. <laughs> Dude. Dude, those great. dudes are huge. Yeah, great video. And, um, you know, so let's talk about. So we talked about Mike Malone, not much, but we're talking about Missoula. Um, let's, let's think about this with Missoula. Because I feel like Ham is fine in LA for, for now. He got some respect. But Missoula no, he's seems done. Like, he's done. Ham's done. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Hundred percent, he's done, bro. Okay. Like if they keep if they keep him, they have zero percent chance of keeping LeBron. How many years contract they, do they sign him to? Like they usually give. It people doesn't matter, bro. LA goes through coaches like normal people go through underwear. Um. So with. So, right, Milwaukee, so I think Ham's around. Dave, you think he's gone? Missoula. I think, I think Missoula and Ham are both gone after the okay, season. Let's talk about Missoula real fast. How do they get rid of Missoula? Do they fire him? Well, I think there's a team that is always looking for a young coach to help them start developing players. So Missoula is going to be looked at as a player, you know, player development to coach, which is <laughs> fine because in two years the Celtics yep. have helped develop two coaches to go develop young teams. Yep, and it's a set for the Celtics, but you know you don't got much more options at this point. You're kind of so, stuck. But here's my question then. Does Brad Stevens have to step in from the front office to make this thing work? If he keeps Brown, yeah. Absolutely. If he keeps Brown, he's got to step in. Now, he's got Will Hardy. He's got... Can um, he fire a head coach? Yeah, because then Will Hardy, that's a third head coach that they prepared. Yep. Well, um, and I think this is the thing, is that here, here's a problem with Missoula, and this is the reality. What if they went and got He doesn't Hardy. have an assistant coach that's been there before. Would Will if Hardy he had an assistant coach? Would Will Hardy quit for the Jazz? Oh fuck no, no. Why Danny Ainge and Will Hardy are, are connected at the you, hip, bro. You think so? But no. Think and, and I say that, and I only say but that is because the Celtics is a better job. Jazz, he never takes the Jazz unless Hardy says yes, he'll come. Yeah, but shit, dude, you you never takes take the, the job, Celtics jazz. job. You know it. What's that? You would take the Celtics job over the Jazz. Well, I mean, yeah, but but here's the thing: is that. Will Hardy. If I'm Will right Hardy, coach. if I'm Will Hardy, I'm saying I've got what nine draft picks. I've got a really good young core that almost made the playoffs. That I think they tanked, and that's why they didn't make the playoffs. Like, we could have made the playoffs. Really young core. I got Danny Ainge, that is one of my best buds. I just got to let this roll. And, and the thing is, Danny Ainge is going to pay him whatever it takes to stay there. And if he's going to go and say, "Hey, I'm getting called by the Celtics," he's going to be like, "Fucked off. I'll give you a four, five, six year deal, whatever you want." Like, he knows how valuable Will Hardy is. I mean, I always joke around with him as being the best-looking coach in the NBA, but he's also, I would consider him 1A, 1B, as far as Coach D and him as the best young coaches in the league. And that that's including assistant coaches as well. Like, he is elite coach, and that there's no way Danny Ainge lets him walk. But it's the Celtics, bro. Celtics championship. I, I, and I... I hear you, but if you would, if you were in this situation, you got a stable environment, right? A stable environment in the Utah Jazz, or you got a turmoil. You've had turned over two coaches now, probably. You've got uh, um, your wife of one of your owners is sleeping with a coach. You've got like all this other shit that's happening in the locker room, and. I would be like, man, I'm cool with my stability. I'm cool with just being happy with getting. $10 million a year and staying here in Utah, you know, like to me, like that, I would pick that. I mean, especially he's got a young family. Like, do you really want to go back to Boston and have all this pressure that you got to win now? Or do you want to be in a spot that you can grow? And as you grow, you put your team out there in a better and better position. I, I think the Utah jazz are going to win a championship in the next uh, 15 yeah, but years. Traditionally they don't in the Celtics. I don't, do. I can't say if that about be, the Celtics though, man. Yeah. If you want to be somebody who wins a, multiple championships in your career, you're better off betting on the Celtics than the jazz. But listen, yes. Mwani, I, I agree with you, bro. Like he's saying, he doesn't think that one year coaches are going to get fired. And I agree. And that's why I'm, I'm sitting here thinking ham will probably hmm. be back. I think also that the only way 
that the Celtics get a different coach is if they bring in their GM to coach, which I know he doesn't want to do. Sure. And if he coaches what for two years and then passes it to Missoula. Yeah. Like, and they keep paying Missoula. Like, like you can't pay two people and be a head coach money. No, you can do it. If you're in the last two years of a contract. True, man. But it's hard. And I, I think I'm, these guys both signed four year deals. I'm looking I'm at just um, guessing. I'm just guessing, but traditionally that's it's a four year deal situation and both these guys are in the first year of that. So I'm just like like you, you can't eat th- like 3 years. Hmm. But maybe you can. But it's like what they're getting paid probably 7 to 7 to 10 million dollars a year. Maybe, but, maybe and, it's and a little less than that, but here's my thing is that I'm looking at the available coaches this year, right, man? Um Monty Williams um you've got uh yeah i know bud holzer you've got all these coaches Bruton that Holzer, know how yeah. to win games there's no way in the world that you don't go out there Nick and at Nurse. least try to get i know could you imagine if you missed out on one of these championship level coaches that's that's my point is that if this was at any other year i keep it i keep the guys that i have in place but this year there is i want to say the nice six thing is championships coaches, you represented pay coaches salary against the salary cap yeah so you pay a coach, you go. pay him $15 million to go away. And you it's need not a, sta- you sta- a stabilizer. You're not saying no to Masula forever. You're saying no right now. Go learn your trade. If you want to come back in the coaching system, cool. We'll give you be the highest assistant paid coaching coach in the league. We'll give you whatever it takes, but we need Budholzer to come in here for two years. We need Blank to come in here for two years. Like we saw in Miami happen when Spolster couldn't do it. You know, Pat Rowley came back into such the a um, good stuff. Coach. So, with Budenholzer, you've got a guy that's going to create an offensive system that is productive. With yeah. Nick Nurse, you're going to have a guy that Nick Nurse. There's another one is elite on the defensive end and creates all sorts of things. Frank I Vogel. think they'd be better off with Nick Nurse. Who do you think they'd be better off with? I, I think be Nick Williams, Nurse. So. Nick oh. Nurse or Nick Vogel would be my or Nick Vogel. Um, Frank. Frank Vogel. Nick another Nurse or Frank Vogel. Coach. Like to me, those two guys they they know how to handle players and they know how to handle attitudes and mentalities so that's what i'm going to but that's just be for stability and i don't want to get too old of a guy because i'm not saying that buck isn't a great coach he does really good with players but i would like to a younger coach than buck and buck is going to be one of those guys that i'm looking at as 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 being uh a stabilizer in los angeles oh buck buck i'm sorry buck bud bud bull uh, yeah okay yeah is it Buck Bottles or Butter Butter? Butter Buck. It's, it's Mike B- <laughs> Budenholzer or something. <laughs> but Which, whatever his name is, uh, I look at him going to Los Angeles, bro. Let's just be honest. Because he could be somebody that stabilizes a ship in L.A. Um, but I, I, I really, really uh, struggle with the Celtics because it's not just one thing they need right now. It's, it's a mentality. It's a lifestyle. It's a, um, you know... I, a separation between church and state, you know, like they don't have that right now. They don't have that with Missoula. They have a coach that is in there playing, doing the assistant coaches stuff. Like that's the one thing I love about coach D is he's young, but he's doing coaching stuff. He's there talking to the guys. He's not there trying to shoot around with them and, and play pickup with them. And, you know, like yelling and screaming at him and pushing him. And like he got, he missed two games this year because he got uh, something happened to his eye socket during uh, a pickup game, you know, like, like that's, I get that mentality and style, but like that's what assistant coaches do. That's what shooting coaches do. You know, that's not what head coaches do. You can't have it's called mixing church and state. You can't be doing that stuff anymore. And I I feel bad for him because he's a great coach, but he's just two to three years away from being able to have that head coach responsibility. And it's not just me saying this, like, you know, Brad Stevens could be like, hey, listen, you got a short year. I'm going to teach you how to be a head coach this next year. It's going to be a different style. Brad Stevens could do that and take him under his wing. But if I'm Brad Stevens, I'm saying I'm not giving uh, you know, $5 billion to this guy, and hopefully he figures it out. I've got to go, and i got to figure this out because if I don't figure this out and I fire the head coach, right, mm-hmm. we don't turn it around, I'm next to go. So he's got to go and he's got to make it sure that either a, he's going to die on the ship or he's going to try to turn it around. And 
I, dude, you've got to try something at this point because you're going to lose Jalen Brown unless you do something different. And as much as you want to say, well, yeah, trade Jalen Brown and get Damian Lillard or get this player, or that player, like you'll never be able to replace Jalen Brown when he's at his peak ever. And as much as people are like, trade him, trade him, trade him. If they trade him, I hope Oklahoma City gets him because he's going to be one of those players that everybody looks back and said, why the fuck would the Celtics trade him? Trade him. Why do they do that? Like, I get it. He has bad games once in a while, but remember, he's still under 24 years old. You know, I was thinking about it as a Thunder fan. It's hard not to, when you see a player like Jeff Green, still getting playing time. And I understand, like, the the sense of urgency we had when when we traded for... Perkins and and I really love Perkins and I defended that trade so much but I finally come to that point where I'm over defending that trade like Jeff Green and Russell Westbrook James Harden and Kevin Durant are all still playing in the NBA Perk is not Perk stopped playing a long time ago I feel like there isn't a moment that you start trading young players that have long NBA careers. Like you should be loyal to these guys forever. And I get like, you can argue we wouldn't have made it to the finals that year. Yeah. But you know what? Our window would have been longer. Sure. And I'd ra- always rather go ahead and bet on a longer window than a higher peak with a, with a faster crash. So I hope like, as we go forward, we, we kind of learn from that. And like, I have a lot of respect for what uncle Jeff does out there. Like he's so consistent. He knocks down shots on a regular basis. He finishes above the rim with authority. He yeah. boxes out. He understands the value of a possession at the end mm. of the game. He's a leader. He plays sporadic minutes and he does whatever job the coach asks for him. And he does it with like the best attitude. And that's why he has like the best reputation in the NBA. And I'm just so, I'm just like, I wish we had never traded him. Like yeah. I, I've always, like I saw him at the um, grocery store when he played for the Thunder and he waved at my daughter and stuff like that. And it's kind of like, it was cool. And I was like, Oh, I like Jeff green, but I never like, well, we have to keep Jeff green cause he's nice. But the longevity of his career has proven to me that trading him was the wrong choice. Yeah. And we should have stuck with the, the youth movement. And if we had, Jeff Green would still be wearing a Thunder uniform and probably the only guy of that group who is still wearing a Thunder uniform. But, you know, neither here nor there. I'm glad for him and his success now. But it's interesting that he's the last of that Thunder group who made it to the playoffs that I mentioned. He's the last one standing right now. Yeah. And and one thing I love about Sam, what he does as well, is is he's not afraid to go to the undrafted players. He's not afraid to go and pick players off of their first rookie um, contract scales. Um, we call it Kenny Hustle plays, um, guys like that that are going to come in and, and, and end up getting another contract for you know eight to ten million dollars, nine, twelve, whatever it is a year. Like those are big time contracts in in the face of the future of their franchise. And um, I look at Sam and say, you know, yes, we, we do we need a big man out there? Yes, but you're right trading these young assets and young players for that big player, big body, extra big body, because that's all it would be right now, isn't worth it. Because we still don't know what type of player Poku, we still don't know what type of player um, all these other guys are going to be yet. We, we can we can sit here and say J-Dub's going to be this type of player, but next year he could go out and tear his Achilles, um, <laughs> tear both of his Achilles on the same play, and next thing you know is it takes him two years to get back to the, the place he was. So we don't really know what's going to happen. We can sit here and say, I think this will happen. I think this will happen, but we don't know. We don't know. I hope you're right, Moani. It's going to be different this time around, guys. Um, and we don't want to be the wolves. Who we don't. Goldberg. Seriously, because like, that, what that, were they uh, thinking? I was thinking about that. We laughed about that so Moani hard. Too. Like, it's about camaraderie, and you bring in a new voice who pushes a player, and it just all of a sudden it's like, can we make this work anymore? Like, if that was a rookie player on a rookie scale contract, it would be so easy to deal with. But giving up that many picks and that much invested, they're all kind of like, well, you guys have to work it out. Yeah, dude. No. I mean, and and that's why we, as Oklahoma City Thunder fans, we want to see the longevity of the team. And how do you create longevity? Well, we've seen it happen in the past in the NBA where teams start to have, you know, success for 10 years. 
well, how do you switch the success for 10 years? Well, I look at the Utah Jazz as a, a great example. You know, they went from Carl Malone, John Stockton, to Darren Williams, right? And Hayward, right? Mm-hmm. And now they're in a different transition. Yes, there's been a transition since then, too. You but got when you, Carlos Boozer. He, he yeah, like you're though. able to, yeah, transition, keep on transitioning. Like keep on getting these players that you draft and then trading them out as, as you go. Now, does the Jazz have a championship behind them that, that no, because they haven't completely ever torn down like the Thunder did. You know, they never cashed in all their players like the Thunder did. And I think that's the difference. If you can watch the Utah Jazz consistently have a team through the last 30 years somehow find a way to compete in in playoffs, right? And then you're able to give them picks behind that. What does that mean? Well, that means that the the Jazz had a number one pick. That's my point. You know, like think of one. One time, and, and and if you think about that, how you're able to consistently keep on going and bringing but if you in look new players, at how come? How were the Spurs able to build five championships? Well, they got two number one picks and put them on the team, and then drafted well behind that. Like, yep. so that's why I'm like, you got to be with the the Celtics over the Jazz. Who knows? Will Hardy and Danny Ainge, they might change the future. But I'm with you. I think the Jazz should have kept tearing down. Like they ended up keeping a few players that. But the they, players they kept, though, I like, though, man. They, they didn't fully commit to it because they wanted to show the value of the players. Yeah, but still. The like, problem they, is they waited to the CBA change now, and those valuable assets they had that they could have got a first-round yeah. draft pick, they don't. Mid, like, trade deadline, <laughs> bro, they could have traded Markkinen for a pretty damn good haul. I know, And dude. it would have been more than what he was worth when they got him. But they were I thinking know. Like, at that I think point, they, they probably could have cashed in a top-five pick this year for him. Yeah. With one of the teams that are in the bottom five, they probably could have gone out to you know Portland or, you know, what I'm saying like, a team yeah. like that would have loved to have Market and and I, you know what, they want to keep him. They look at it as a part of their their future. And I, Walker Kessler, I like that 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 matchup with those guys. Um, it works well in Utah. So it does, dude. I'm excited about the finals, bro. We're almost here, one game away. It seems like it's apparent. The writing is on the wall. Now the Celtics just have to lay down, and they've got some figuring out to do, like the Lakers do, but the Nuggets are a juggernaut, and the Heat are about as determined as I've ever seen a team ever. come into the, the playoffs. It, it's interesting with the Heat that, if you think back, they lost their, their playing game. They lost their way into the tournament. I know, it's insane. They went one-on-one one in the play-ins. One and one in the play-ins, and then dude, now, it's like they picked don't. Bucks, man. That's what who they wanted to play. It's Jimmy saying, "Hey guys, we gotta lose this first game because we don't play the Bucks. We won't play the Bucks. All right, <laughs> that's dope. I love that, dude. I love that. All right, man. Let's get back on and talk tomorrow. All right, dude. Done. I hope you guys will join us. Hell yeah, guys. Thanks See a lot. See you then. See ya.